Carl Singleton, and we thank you for joining us here. Uh, what I'd like to do right, right now is just talk directly to our community um, in what regards to what we're going to be doing from this platform. What I need us to understand is uh, this is an opportunity for us to take full advantage of the current times. A seat at the table uh, comes before you as an opportunity through podcasts, which we're designed to ensure that we serve as a conduit that directly engages predominantly black communities with decision makers and those with connections to them. Ultimately, ensuring communities' needs are met by accessing available resources. So our motto is less work. The way that the will continue throughout this program and podcast overall is we will introduce a topic. We will then invite a guest who he or she is considered a subject matter expert and or have access to subject matter experts that can release, engage, and or influence resources that our communities need. Um, the way that I look at it and we've looked at it as a team overall is we have for a long time as Harrisburg community in greater Harrisburg as black individuals, predominantly black city and region. Um, we've been looking from behind the eight ball, as we say, uh, with no pun intended. So this overall podcast is designed to ensure equitable access at decision-making tables. Um, this table in particular is one that we are in control of. It is one that we direct. It is one that we will ensure um, properly engages our community at large. With that being said, um, I thought it not robbery to have our first guest, of course, being none other than Harrisburg's own former city councilman and current Chick-fil-A executive uh, in Atlanta, Pennsylvania now, Mr. Cornelius Johnson. Um, Cornelius is a young man that we all have come to know, love, and appreciate. Um, he serves as a great role model for not only our black males, but our black females as well um, throughout our communities. Being a young man who's grown up uh, in our urban environment, who has aspired to greatness beyond uh, SciTech High, onto Penn State University Capital Campus, and then coming back, uh, assuming the corporate role in Hershey, various Hershey companies. Um, and now is an executive again at Chick-fil-A. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our first guest. Let's work, Mr. Cornelius Johnson. Hey, what's up, my man? How you doing, man? I'm happy to be here. All right, all right. So what I'd like to do first, Cornelius, is of course, thank you for being our first guest. Uh, we wouldn't have had it any other way. Uh, the way that we see it is, this, now we could talk about a lot of things, but we understand that deeds and action outweigh words. So for us, bring in one of our pillars, um, like yourself, um, we just like to thank you as a team here at Music Man Multimedia Center, um, with our, uh, one of our sponsors as well. Of course, the district chat, uh, Scott, Scott, as we know, we talked about a bit off camera uh, earlier, but just having you here with us so that our words can truly be shown throughout our actions with regards to bringing one of our own back home and you think they're not robbery to come back uh, all, um, you know, digitally now. So, and, it, and it's just amazing just to kind of just to see the growth. Everyone knows how much of the staple 
that Music Man has been to the community and just to see that they're able to evolve even as we are in the middle of a pandemic. So to see the growth in, in Music Man and allowing this platform to be created, as well as um, we know there's, you know, Chad in the background and just seeing the growth of all the businesses that he has his hand on and being, um, you know, excited for what district looks like as we going to go out of post pandemic. But just knowing that all these people are still being engaged because I, I feel I feel as though, you know, when we first were talking about the pandemic, the pandemic, we were thinking it was just a temporary one to two month thing. Look, it was almost a year later. So just knowing that, hey, there's key players still caring about the community, still pouring into the community and still trying to keep the conversation going is is is, is unexplainable and it's, it's amazing. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, and of course, there's, there, where, where we are right now is, <clears throat> you know, as, as we know, on a local, state and federal level, um, it, the, the importance of having uh, consistency, the importance of having role models that uh, represent, not only represent diversity in terms of mindset, but represent diversity in terms of how we look. Um, and that is an imperative, especially current day, as what we're trying to do is, is showcase future generations what can be done in the entrepreneurial section and for, as far as the corporate um, uh, areas with regards to not only jobs, but career pathways. So mm -hmm. you a bit about, uh, if you can start us off and talk a little bit about um, your uh, maturation from Harrisburg School District over to, um, you know, searching out, seeking out colleges. Yeah. Uh, that was your choice, um, your, mm -hmm. your focus, and then uh, growing to uh, coming back um, after graduation, continuing um, on into, I'm sure you've had cert several cert certifications in order to continue uh, that learning. Yeah. And you know we're going to go after that as we talk yeah. about you already know. So, I mean, you know, Harris, I'm born and raised in Harrisburg, everyone knows that. And really, you know, even before I can even open up about just like my story, it's just really, you know, first giving praises just to God for just like really, you know, um, watching over my life, continue to guide my life as I made, continue to make mistakes and have made mistakes in the past and just being able to place um, certain people, um, certain situations just um, in my life. So I'm able to grow and mature, you know, as a human being. So, you know, I, even before I can even start there, I just always have to start with like God. Um, but, you know, outside of that, just as, as some people may know, like I'm born and raised on Allison Hill side of, of Harrisburg, right there on 20th and Holly. Um, you know, I have amazing parents, um, my mom who, you know, who played a significant role inside my life of just keeping me on the right track. Um, my dad also doing the same thing on his side and even just the support side of, you know, I am i don't come from a, you know, two parent, you know, inside the house, you know, household like my parents, you know, I don't remember them being together. So I had amazing support side as far as, you know, my stepmother, my stepfather, you know, all those extended side of the families where, you know, I think a lot of homes, you know, look like that, where, you know, it's not typically your your nuclear family as American design says it should be, but it's what we call family is where we receive love. So with that love was my foundation of being able to, you know, just be a kid, you know, and just um, start off at Merrill's, was able to um, go to Math Science Academy in fifth grade. And really, I always tell people, like, if I had to look back at one point in time in my life where it was like a turning point of really putting me on that right track was really my experiences at Math Science Academy. It, it gave me the opportunity to be around just, just other like-minded, young, nine, ten-year-old kids who, you know, was still a kid at heart. And they created an environment where learning was just the thing to do. You know, like, hey, there's so many different distractions and we can go on and talking about that for days of what kids are distracted by, by TV, games, you know, just social life, sneakers and all the, you know, money, all those type of things. But, you know, those set of teachers that we had at Mass Science Academy really drove home the importance of learning and getting education. A lot of those same uh, people who I had around me um, as my peers at Math Science Academy are still my friends to the, to this day. And they all 
are all different aspects of life just doing amazing things. So just being able to just go through that system um, was one of the first class to really, not, we always joke around, like our class was really like the guinea pig class for, for science tech. Mm-hmm. So like we started off, um, I don't know. And yeah, I mean, Carl, Carl, you was on school, school board around that time. You know, it was a lot of shifting and moving with different things like that. So we moved from, you know, Math Science Academy was good fifth and sixth grade, then they went away with it seventh grade, sent back to home, you know, elementary schools, then they put it together back in eighth grade. In the ninth grade, I was actually at Harrisburg High School inside the basement, and they call it like Polytechnical Institute or what whatnot. And um, and there, that was just an amazing experience. Like, you know, as when you when you're growing up and you're in eighth grade, and that's when Roland just started to kick off a little bit. You just like, oh, I just want to go to the high. I want to go to the high. So, I, you know, I was able to go to the high in ninth grade year. I was getting, getting. The, I was at the high before the high as people see it now. You see what I'm saying? Before the con- the new construction where they were still allowed to fry chicken, and you know, we were still eating that that good food. You you were being immersed in the culture. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, it was it was it was good times there, Miss Kimber. Um, you know, Miss Kimber and Miss Waller to pioneers inside of our community who were just two strong black women who you know truly showed they cared for you and i think you know understanding like being a kid growing up in harrisburg there is nothing like being feeling like you're cared for so like when we're thinking about even kids now and like comparing like what i felt like when i and I, I would kind of root that into some of the things I was able to do is each step in each step in my life, uh, whether that was at home or different places along my way in education, I felt like they were there who genuinely cared for me. And that really made the difference. Um, you, so go ahead. Let me uh, jump in there because I know the, the love and respect that you have for your overall family, your nuclear family, you mm-hmm. know, and, but let's let's talk specifically, especially with the level of. Uh, we'll, we'll say uh, disrespect that our black women face a lot. Mm-hmm. Not to highlight that right now, we will address that as well. Um, but let's talk about what you just hit on, which was the nurturing uh, factor that helped groom and guide you outside of your home, which was a safe place in the, in, in the, in the school, um, mm-hmm. and dealing with education. And then um, was my what may be missing for our young people now. And it's not letting the black males off the hook at all. Yeah. And we as black males, I believe, must continue to highlight um our, our, our black women in the more positive. Mm-hmm. So we've lost two uh not lost because we know they are, but we yeah. no longer in the physical presence of Miss Camber and Mrs. Waller. Um uh, but they've left staples in our community, a, a legacy of service through education that a lot of our young people need to maintain, uh, need to remain on in order to understand uh, levels of success, you know, post 18, we'll say. So if you mm-hmm. can talk about that. Yeah, man, I can, you know, I can go down the line and I feel like depending on who's listening and just start naming some of these teachers who, you know, when you think about the spirit of being cared for, so I can go down to my third grade teacher, Miss Montgomery, who I had at Merrill's and how she how she was a strong black woman who, you know, she laid down the law, man. Like if we acted up, we had right assignments and cursive, but you know, it took me a while to realize that she, that was her way of caring for us. And the moment I didn't enjoy that one second of it, I thought she was the meanest teacher ever, but it was the way she was showing how she cared for us. Transitioning on to uh, Math Science Academy and just thinking about uh, Miss Groom, like Miss Groom, like I can go over Miss Groom's house today, you know, and she would we would could laugh and talk and she would cook up a meal. But the type of love that she has shown us, and I believe she's still teaching now that she continues to show students, is that level of love of feeling cared for. So I think, you know, it can go on and on and on about naming different, especially strong black women inside the Harrisburg School District who literally became second mothers. To a lot of people, a lot of kids, you know, matriculating through um, the district and just doing more than just teaching um, what, what's inside the books. They taught you the game of life. They taught you, um, they hugged you when you needed to be hugged. They, they, um, they laugh with you when you need to laugh. They cry with you when you need to cry. So I think 
you know, anything we can do more to kind of highlight those moments. I think there's a million other, you know, kids who can literally go on and tell these same stories about a lot of the same people that I'm talking about um, is significant. And I think, you know, in a perfect world, it's just like, how can we cr create um, more of those types of teachers, like whether that's just like from learning to learning experience, like recruiting, but it truly makes a difference inside a child life, no matter if you're coming from a perfect household or a broken household or not a household at all. Like when you, school takes up so much of your time that that love that you receive inside that environment could make the difference. I agree. And what I won't do is have you come on here and uh, name all those important uh, black women educators in your oh, life. Miss Tampon too. Let me, let me not forget about her over there too. No, that, <laughs> simply saying, I got to jump in the fun now. Um, <laughs> so with Miss Miss Anita Mobley and Miss Earlette, yeah. Sutter, um, you know Miss Ruth Jackson was counselor in the district. You know, there's um, I can't forget Miss Adams. You know, uh, uh, Dr. Stanton, who I had at, at Harrisburg High, Dr. Adams and Dr. Stanton, two doctors. I had Dr. St I had Dr. Stanton in my ninth grade year. I walked into her class late and she literally had, I think it was probably maybe two or three other people walked in there late. Cause it was my first day at the high school. So, you know, I'm walking through the high, I got my, my, my new outfit on and she, she laid it into me. Evidently you were cutting classes. You were right in the basement. Wasn't your first day at Harrisburg High School. Right. I, I, was, I was I was a freshman. I was figuring it out, man. I was I was, I was trying to check the scene out. Ms. Lynn Scott John, definitely. I see the names coming up. But definitely so I knew we were gonna get trouble once you started naming names. <laughs> Dr. Barbat, and you got it. All mm -hmm. right, so what we better do because other women are chiming in right now. What we better do is transition to a, another topic. Uh yeah, I would say can I say this last thing on it? I think the fact is that we can still remember and name these people. I mm -hmm. think you know, those who are around in the physical sense, I think I would challenge everyone just to sit, just to set it, say a note of thank you because they have just made an impact to their lives. And we don't know where they're at right now and what they could be experiencing through COVID, but just knowing just to say thank you, let them know that they are appreciated, let them know that we are grateful of how they poured into it. I think, you know, I myself am probably going to do the same thing um, in the next coming weeks. Agreed, agreed. All right, so... Um changing gears just a, a little bit in transition. We talked about the education side, that solid foundation that prepared you to do something. And that something turned out to be corporate America. Um, could you talk some, a uh, little bit about uh, leaving Penn State or, you know, let's blend it a bit. Let's talk about how you've left Harrisburg High SciTech campus and matriculated to Penn State Capital Cam uh, University Park and mm -hmm. then came back and got involved, you know, in your professional life. Can you talk a little bit uh, about it? Yep, and I feel like I'm at a point where I can be completely real. So, like, when you I was to Penn State, yeah, so like, able yeah, I, yeah, I'm going to be completely open to kind of, you know, peel back, peel back some of those onions, yeah. <laughs> so, like, um, you know, I did very well in high school just through that love and just being around that core group. Like, I was able to graduate you know, around the top of my class, have stellar grades. Um, I end up getting, you know, a full ride to Penn State. I really wanted to go to Howard. Howard didn't give me enough money. Like, I was set on Howard. And I'm jealous of all my friends who end up going to Howard. But like, when my mom got the call about a full scholarship to Penn State, that's where I was going. So I went up to Penn State, University Park. And University Park is just a, just a different experience. 50,000 kids up there. Um, and the majority of it is, is, is white kids. You see what I'm saying? There's a good amount of black people. Let's just say there's 50,000 kids up there. Let's just say there's about four to 5,000 black people. So like we have our own, it's a, that's his own college in essence, but it's still when you're around that much, um, you know, white people, it's just, you still feel, you still feel that um, impact of what that looks like in comparison to growing up in the city, going to Harrisburg High. Um, so I, I could be honest to tell you, like my first, two to three years of college was really, really rough. Like um, my major originally was biology. Um, I wanted to um, I wanted to go to medical school at that time. Um, and it wasn't like, so like, you know, people can talk about like college life and parties and stuff like that. So I was definitely going to parties. I was definitely having fun, but I was also going to class. However, what I had to learn quickly is just because I was going to class didn't mean that I could just walk in and just pass the test. 
So like one thing I had to develop and it took me a while to develop in such in, inside um, my major was to realize that I had to learn how to study properly. You see what I'm saying? And I had to know how to prioritize things. And it, and I, I learned a costly lesson with that. Like I transparently, like at the end of my second year, I lost my scholarship. Like I could not maintain the required um, GPA and it was crushing. So I had to, you know, have these conversations with my mom and my dad. I'm literally in tears, like, you know, thinking like the world's about to, you know, explode. Like, you know, I have this great opportunity and, you know, I'm not able to maintain it. It wasn't, it, it, in my opinion, it wasn't from a, a lack of trying. It's from a, a lack of, you know, obviously I could have worked hard, harder, but it was just figure, figure it out, you know. Um, but, you know, just through the grace of God, I was able to obtain um, some student loans and figure, and really figure out the rest of Penn State. And by the end of my um, my fifth year, because I ended up graduating with two degrees, one in toxicology, one in general science, I was on the dean's list. So I think that sense of maturity, you know, of kind of going through a tough time, facing a hurdle, um, and being learning how to overcome it was was key. You know, I, I feel very, very blessed that, you know, um, I was in a position to be able to get loans and be able to finish out my college career because I just know like that's sometimes not the story for everyone. But it taught me so much, um, you know, about myself and how to persevere through hard times. And then just from Penn, from Penn State, I was able to I got a couple job interviews and the day I graduated, I didn't have a job. Um, but three days later, I got a call from a, this company in Pittsburgh, which was an environmental consulting company. And they said, hey, we want we want to hire you. So I immediately, you know, packed my bags, moved to Pittsburgh. Um, and actually one of my best friends, um, Marcus, he actually got end up getting a job in Pittsburgh, too. So we are we are 23, you know, living in downtown Pittsburgh. I'm living with my best friend. Um, having a job. So it's like, you know, that's that's the dream. You see what I'm saying? Um, and that's just another testimony of God of just saying like, hey, put your trust in me. I have a lot of prayer warriors around me who say like, I got you. So I went up to Pittsburgh, uh, worked for this environmental consulting company for about six months. And I realized like, hey, I don't enjoy what I did, what I was doing. So for that company, I was writing on what people call like safety data sheets. So if you ever turn like like um, if you look at a Windex bottle and you turn it around and it says, don't spray inside your eyes, don't spray inside your skin because of this type of reactions. Um, for new chemicals that were coming on the market, I used to write those safety data sheets based upon the compounds and the chemicals. Um, so mm -hmm. it was very boring. Um, so I started applying for new opportunities. So two opportunities popped up around the time. There was one opportunity to stay in Pittsburgh and work for UPMC um, doing research. And the second opportunity was to actually move back to Harrisburg um, to become the health inspector. So I'm going to give, so I always, anytime I'm telling my story, I always give a huge shout out to, um, you know, Mayor Linda Thompson, because at that time I was 23 years old, didn't, knew, didn't know anything about food safety. I had the science background and literally I went, in, went into an interview it was like five different people in there. It's like Linda Thompson, uh, Miss Linda Thompson, Mayor Linda Thompson, um, HR director, uh, two HR directors, uh, the co's director. And I'm like, you know, I'm 23 years old. It's like a panel of six, seven. It's like the biggest interview, you know, I ever ever had at the time. And you know, they they took a bet on me, and that bet is still paying off today. So that goes to show, like, you know, people in positions, you know, putting people Put, putting others in positions can have lifelong impact. So there's no way that I would be inside food safety today if Mayor Thompson didn't take a chance on me um, back when I was 23. And that's another highlighting another black woman mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. So, you know, this is my experience um, being a health inspector. I was able to get trained by the Department of Agriculture. Um, you know, and I worked for about I worked for the city for about two years. Probably one of the biggest thing that people always want me to, to tell, like when I was there, when I was there, was you know there were some things going on at the Broad Street Market, and I, the Broad Street Market had the temporary shutdown to get things right. I was that guy. Everyone always was always <laughs> joking, laughing, laughing at me about that. But it was um, it taught me a lot. It really got me 
into the realm of food safety and join and also help me understand about local politics. So around that time when our mayor, Mayor Thompson um, was around, you know, that was the end of the read days and there was just a lot of pressure within Harrisburg. And I was just always inside the city, just reading the news, just trying to figure out like what's going on and saying like, hey, that don't make sense or that's what's that coming from this and that. So um, I got to follow that the whole way through before leaving to actually take a position at Susquehanna Township um, to um, lead up their code department and also do health inspections there. And around that time in my life, I'm saying like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm liking government. I do like the science aspect of it, but I'm also liking government. So I actually went back to school and went to Shippensburg to get my uh, master's in public administration um, just to kind of really get down to like the nitty gritty of what is the wheels that has government rolling. Um, so um, just being able to work out there with Gary Myers and really just understand, you know, uh, fundamentals behind running a city and things of that nature. That's what really got spurred me into, you know, just understanding what was happening in Harrisburg at that time and really sparked interest in running for Harrisburg City Council. So what was that like when you made that, um, when you decided to, to further serve the city um, mm -hmm. an elected position? Um, what, what, how did you make that decision? Uh, how do you think that decision has impacted your, your uh, choices going forward with regards to, or your vision going forward, not choice, but your visions going forward with having the experience of a young, young gentleman uh, being involved, um, you know, in, in a large city and mm -hmm. then coming back home, which we all must, yeah, and, you know, trying your hand now or your talents, placing your talents now in, the, in, in out there in a way where um, you're truly providing a service, whether people know it or not from an elected. Yeah. Talk about that. So, yeah. So, like, honestly, um, you know, I think when people are thinking about running for political office, it's just like, you know, there's always this illusion like, hey, there's like this secret society out there that comes and dubs you and, you know, and, and finds you and this and that. Honestly, I made that decision around some of like my closest friends. So like I'm understanding politics, I'm seeing what's going on. I'm not necessarily, I'm feeling like, hey, I have the knowledge, I, I care, you see what I'm saying? And I wanna offer, um, not outside of just offering, being involved from the other things I was doing. I was always involved in the community, volunteering things of that nature, but I wanted to be, you know, have that seat at the table to help drive decisions. So literally I, was, I sat around the, around the table with one of my good friends, Marcus, one of my good friends, um, Brian Cox, who I went to school with, all the way from Math Science Academy. Um, at that time, um, Councilwoman Danielle Bowers, like she's a close um, family friend. She helped me make that decision. Also just talked to my mom and my dad and things like that. And I just, I just went for it. You see what I'm saying? I realized that, hey, I'm gonna put myself out there. Even if I lose, um, I'm gonna feel good that I, I, I'm, get, I'm, I'm trying. You see what I'm saying? I felt like, that was what was missing for a little bit in Harrisburg is feeling like, hey, where's that young voice of, you know, being able to relate to the, the, the community that's coming up um, and trying to make make a change in that different. So and that's, let me let me yeah. let me cut in on that one, especially yeah. uh, you, you hit on you hit on two points that we definitely uh, want to touch on um, with our foundational show. But you know, moving forward. So you're giving us a good platform from which to, or foundation from which to launch. You talked about there being a perceived perception of a secret society and mm -hmm. working backdoor deals. You know, that's not a perception. You mm -hmm. said, we real yeah. this. you know, it happens. You know that it's not a boogeyman. It's actually people who talk yeah. to you, want to have meetings in public, who don't want to have meetings, who want to do the back room uh, deals and conversations, so forth and so on, and then throw the rock, hide their hands, so to speak. So, can you talk a little bit about um, those about about the political crosswinds that you that you have to um, that you balance that you were able to balance successfully? I would say uh, mm -hmm. because you forgot who you are and who you are and your um, your uh, allegiance to the community from which you were elected to serve. So, can you talk about that? Absolutely. So, I think um, what is you. And I'm just going to talk personally from my story. So, you know, Carl, you hit it on the head. Like, there are many situations where, you know, um, there are people 
who are in in the background, either trying to find people to do certain things for to serve their best interests and not necessarily the community's best interest. So I would say like, you know, there's there's always anytime there's someone new who pops up or someone who has come from a real genuine heart from a place of service, you know, and just say, hey, I'm gonna put myself out there to serve. You know, there are people who are out there to kind of say like, hey, let me try to bring him in and kind of see what he's about and really have them like under my wing. And sometimes that comes from a very loving place. And sometimes that comes from a, a place of where they want you, you're only as good to them as long as you are doing for them. And I think, I think it's important to realize that any office within public service that you need to be doing for the people. So like my big thing was like, I'm open to talk to anybody. Like, if you're, in, if you're in the city of Harrisburg and you care, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to hear you out. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to let you control or impact my decision just to serve your interests. Because I think we have seen how that has played out um, in the past years where certain interests were being served, which led to poor bond deals, heavy debt on the city, all type of things that me being a kid that I had to, you know, tell some of those stories of how I was shifted around you know, elementary schools that I was, a, you know, that I had to go through. And I know that inside my heart of hearts, at the end of the day, when it came to me making the decision, I wanted to make a decision that, you know, was the right decision for the community, not the right decision because someone said it was the right decision. Agreed. I couldn't agree more. Um, in the, the irony in having this conversation with you now is that we have... Uh, I would say a, 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 a very nice population of young people uh, who are, I will just say millennials, you know, um, right now who are primed and ready to go with regards to leadership roles yep. um, that, that don't need permission, that don't need uh, come this way. They, don't, they really, all they need is a support system to say, here's where I failed, here are where the pitfalls are. I'm going to move out of the way and point you in the right direction. Not that I'm going to tell you which direction you have to go, but if you come to me seeking out knowledge, seeking out truth, seeking out um, 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 experiences that I have um, um, overcome or witnessed other people's, you know, failures within, um, what I'll give you. And so, could you talk a little bit to um, the the young people, your generation, that is still out here that you probably still engage in? Um, could you talk a little bit about the importance of to thy own self be true? Yeah, absolutely. And just to even just to take it back a little bit, then move forward there. Like everyone knew, you know, even just from me being young and paying attention to what was happening inside the city um, and to the time where I ran, like everyone knew like what politics looked like back in the day was truthfully, if Mayor Reed and W and tap you on your shoulder or said it was OK for you to run that right. you didn't stand a chance, you see what I'm saying? And I think that has put an element over Harrisburg for years to kind of feel like that, hey, someone has to tell you or you have to be of a certain statute to be able to, to hold these offices. But I think what is, what is coming now, what I'm hopeful for, is a certain fire that's coming out of you know people my age who are actively being involved in wanting a change. So like I can think of, you know, there's current people serving. Like we can think of Councilman Bowers. We can think of um, Council Member um, uh, Westburn Majors. Uh, we can think of Destiny Hodges who came. She made, you know, she was she was young when she decided to run for school board, and right. then she transitioned to serve on on Harrisburg City Council. Um, but then you could also think about people who are just out on the ground who always just been doing work. So you can, you know, I can start naming names, and I'm hoping people inside. I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to have the time to name everyone. So people just throw out some more names. But you can see what is happening as far as capital rebirth, the bridge. You can see other just organic things that are happening with, um, you know, I got Brian Majors and, um, you know, Major Prep and, and the things he has been able to innovate around. Um, there's certain longstanding organizations that are just doing amazing things. And we can just keep going and going and going and really. To the, to the point, it's just like, we don't need gatekeepers any longer to tell us what to do or how to impact. Like if there is a need 
or something that we can uh, fulfill. Like I feel like we are starting to empower ourselves to fulfill that. I think um, the different conversation that I'm having amongst our peers is, and I'll say it over and over, about being um, comprehensive and strategic. So a lot of times, because we have a lot of fire, you know, and we're not wanting to kind of wait for anyone, if we see the void, we're just going to create our own program. So that's why we, we're seeing like a whole bunch of like nonprofits and things pop up because we see a void happening and we want to do something because we can remember the time when we was a kid and we lacked something or a basic need wasn't being met. And we don't want that to be for the next generation. So so we do something about it. But what I the challenge is now is at the end of the day, Harrisburg is a, a city of 50,000 people. So there's a ways that we could strategically map things out to make sure that we have a larger reach where everyone is able who wants to make an impact can make an impact and it's and it's hitting you know the broader population because what I because what tends to happen is when you have all these different things going on everyone's fighting for little pieces of scraps but when if we collectively look around and kind of figure out like hey this is our strategic plan our vision for the community and this vision is it's bigger than any vision that anyone in any political seat can create. It's a, it's a vision that can be molded in the community first and then saying like, hey, all right, people in power, this is how we want you to fit in. That's how we are able, that's how Harrisburg is going to move forward. And that's how they're going to be able to make an impact. So, you know, there's this new thing. I don't know if you, I, I saw you on there a little bit like Clubhouse where a lot of people are on there having um, engaging conversations and thinking of that same mindset. And I'm just trying to like pour in to kind of give them some of that um, knowledge that I received just the way government works and just tell them different ways to kind of they can be strategic and be comprehensive inside their approach. Shout out to my to my uh, cousin, my hero, uh, Naeem Singleton, who introduced me to Clubhouse. Uh, so he put me through the Clubhouse 101 class. So I'm thankful for that. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about um, the elephant in the nation now. Mm hmm. Let's talk about D.C. Yeah, man. All right. So let's talk about uh, since we're on the political side of things, I'm sure it's, it would it, it would be unlike me not to um, get into some good trouble, as we've said. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about the impact um, regarding what we witnessed last week um, and how that has been labeled by the media or not labeled or try to be, you know, avoid it um, in <laughs> I personally, you know, I've had various conversations um, highlighting the the fact that if not before, then last week, there is empirical evidence that we live in two Americas. Mm -hmm. and from this perspective, I like to, of course, I can talk on and on about it, but I want to, you know, of course, give, give the guests the seat at the table um, to talk about, from your perspective, uh, the, the two Americas and, you know... Uh, we don't even have to talk about the the fact that we experienced it ourselves here in Harrisburg, but let's focus on a current event of there being two Americas with the treasonous acts, um, the the overall um, just domestic terrorism that yeah. place uh, on on the Capitol grounds in, in D.C. Yep, and the, so like to preface that too is um, now that I'm down here in Atlanta, you know, literally come after. The, the next day after Georgia, you know, elects, you know, their first black um, senator, you know, thinking about Georgia, you're thinking about, you know, Atlanta, thinking this is the pastor who is, is a pastor of Martin Luther King's church, you know, whose mom was was a sharecropper. Um, just thinking about how powerful that story is and then thinking about even just John Ossoff, he's the youngest senator, senator ever elected. And they're both two Democrats from a a state that has probably never has hasn't elected a Democratic um, um, senator <laughs> in a very very long time. So the fact that they are able to elect two in the very next day of what we seen and seen displayed in D.C., you know, I couldn't believe it. Like I was literally, you know, everyone's working from home. I'm working from home behind my computer, and I'm able to kind of, and I'm I'm getting some text messages. I walk to the screen, on um, the TV, and I'm looking like. Yo, this this is not happening. And first, you see it happening, right? So you see, 
you know, these um, Trump supporters, you know, on the steps of the Capitol. And you're just like, all right, I'm waiting for someone to show up. I'm waiting for, you know, Capitol Police or National, um, National Guard or someone to kind of really, you know, proceed to get this under control. And then you realize that is not happening. Like, they're actually going further. You're starting to see windows um, smashed out. Um, and then over the, the course of the week, you know, we're, we're seeing all these pictures. Like, I literally, the, the picture that blows me is literally on the House floor. You have a guy in um, full army fatigue, right, with zip ties, looked like he was loaded with weapons. Like, this looking like they was really down to form, form a coup. Like, there's no telling if they was able to get hold of one of the congressional uh, members, what they would have done. So inside my mind, realizing, you know, who I am as a black man inside America, you know, I can't see myself um, with a whole bunch of my black brothers and sisters being on the U.S. Capitol steps allowed to do the same thing. And I think the key word um, that I use inside that statement is allowed. Um, Because, you know, by the looks of it, you know, this wasn't like a rally that popped out of nowhere. This was pre-planned. This was pre-planned. There was a speech before then that looked like in, that incited it. So it was. It was. It has the appearance like it was allowed to happen. Like there was no type of pre-planning in comparison to what we're hearing, um, even from organized um, rallies in the past, where all this pre-planning as far as having people stage, fencing, the thing of that nature were put in place. But because it's a different group that doesn't look like me and you um, with a different agenda, it just, you know, it, it's definitely not equal. Yeah. Yes. And so, I, I, you know, I won't even, what I'll do right this point is I'm going to ask the callers to uh, begin utilizing our call in numbers so you, we can engage with, with the community at large. That number again, you can call us directly at 717-903-8760. 717-903-8760. Phone lines are open. Uh, so while we wait for uh, further engagement, what has been, uh, f from you being in Atlanta, let's talk about uh, the, the the euphoria. The, let's talk about the 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 love, the, you know, the respect, the, the overall, uh, feeling of, was it, was it Obama S like that? <laughs> but, I mean, almost nothing can almost touch, nothing can touch that, but you know, yeah. you know, and here yeah. on, here on earth, nothing can touch that. We'll say that. But mm -hmm. what is that like being down there knowing you were a part of this almost yeah. it was bigger than president Obama's election because in this current political time where the Senate depended on mm. two, not one, you know, but two seats to come out of Georgia. Yeah. So we didn't have to, again, depend on our sister yeah. to put us in the vice president position, you know, Senate mm -hmm. vice president elect um, Kamala Harris. So we were able, Georgia was able to save America. Yeah, uh, and, from and, I would, and, and I would say there's like, you know, there was two events because at first you had to even just think about the, you know, even though the presidential race didn't come down to Georgia, the fact that Georgia was able to turn blue in this presidential race was significant. Um, it goes to show that there was a lot of groundwork that was done in order to kind of turn to, to kind of, um, you know, turn the color. You know, a lot of a lot of credit goes out to Stacey Abrams, uh, but I think there's all also a lot of other strong black women who were in the trenches um, who Stacey Abrams supported to overall get people involved. And it wasn't it wasn't just um, getting people registered to vote. Like we have millions and millions of people registered to vote, but they were able to break it down to and give them a reason to vote. Why voting is important. So like. I feel like that is the next step. So we're always we're always prone on voter registration, voter registration. I can register to vote, but if I feel like this election doesn't impact my life, that's not what's going to drive me to the polls. So I, I've heard Stacey Abrams talk about 
you know, actually, you know, hitting the pavement and educating people. So, you know, going into the Senate race, you know, people were saying like, hey, you know, are, you know, Democrats going to have that turnout, you know, as they did the, as a presidential election? Because voting down here is very different in Pennsylvania. So in Pennsylvania, you don't have to worry about runoff elections. So I, I am guaranteed in Pennsylvania to go to the poll twice. Um, in 2020, I went to the polls about four times um, for various elections inside Georgia due to um, runoff elections. So just, you know, me, I was kind of complaining about it myself of saying like, hey, like, you know, if you come in first place, you win. You see what I'm saying? So because I know just being in the political um, realm, what it takes to get people to come out again, because it's not like you get a day off or you know, um, you get paid to get votes. Like people have real lives to live in the midst of doing all that. So for people to get educated once again on the Senate race of why it was important to show up, show up um, again, um, just to um, turn Georgia blue for the Senate seats, it's, it's, it's amazing. And I think what, what, what I get from that is like you, we can speak on off elections within Harrisburg, Dauphin County, these congressional seats that, you know, people like Scott Perry and them people and people like him occupy of where we have to really educate our voters on why it matters. Because if Dauphin County was to vote the way that votes for presidential elections, um, certain seats, whether that's commissioner seats, congressional seats, would change to re reflect the policies and platforms of, of the majority city within Dauphin County. That's, um, a, so a lot of, go ahead. that's, that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, and you'll be proud. You, you, you've known me for years uh, inside and outside of politics. And, you know, I'm the same person in terms of straight shooter, um, no matter what form we're in. Um, believe it or not, um, I openly engaged, uh, you know, Scott Perry with regards to how um, his response to, Black Lives Matter and, and other incidents in terms of talking about institutionalized racism and systemic oppression. And so what we've been able to do is through this platform, continue to reach out to not only uh, Patty Kim, Representative Kim, who's going to be on with us tomorrow, but other elected officials. I reached out to George Hartwick. I reached out to Jeff Hayes. I reached out to Mike Priest, um, Tim, Tim DeFore, who made histories, you know, state order uh, individuals that are going to be on this platform. These are there are individuals that have an open invitation ongoing um, because uh, what I firmly believe is that they serve the people, um, mm -hmm. independent of personal uh, differences and or preferences. The bottom line is they are the elected officials. I and others in this room are constituents that are providing an all. I'm sorry, that is providing a platform for other constituents to take full advantage of as we're seeing thank you again for all the viewers um that we're seeing happen what's happening tonight and i'm sure it's more about having uh miss cornelius johnson on than it is for us those of us that <laughs> thank you mr johnson for you know for for um having our likes and our, our views going up but oh also, no no man I, I i would say that the, the, the one thing i would say too is just like um just as like my thoughts inside my head is like, you know, one one question that always pops into my head, and this is maybe completely off topic, but I think it's so important to express. Like, we as Black people in America um, go through so much, and then we always trying to figure out like, what does like Black joy look like? Like, what what does it truly mean for us to be like happy? So a lot of times we equate like that happiness to financial success like hey if i'm going if i'm getting the money you know i gotta be happy because we've been so deprived economically with inside this country for so long we look towards money to fulfill like our happiness and really while money is nice and money can lead to great opportunities and we know that is a huge gateway and in my personal belief it's probably economic equality is greater than any, you know, it's probably like our first step to getting that political equality equality that we're looking for. I think it's not a and, it's not a or thing, it's an and knowing that hey, we have to strengthen ourselves economically and, and gaining that power. But we mm -hmm. also have to realize that protecting like our 
our mental peace and our happiness and the things that we value, cherishing the people that we love is, is probably the greatest gift of all. So going down to just looking at like, you know, our, our kids and, you know, cause kids can get to the habit at a very young age of just chasing money. You see what I'm saying? And like feeling like, Hey, I need to have, or I got to get this money. And that sometimes leads them down to a certain path. And that's just, just the, the product of our mindset of being caught inside this rat race inside of America. And while it's important for us to, to, to thrive and be able to fulfill our basic needs, let's not make, let's make sure that's not the only thing that defines our happiness. So just being around the people that you love, cherishing them, um, strong value, strong moral, strong community. Mm -hmm. So hands on, uh, hands down, that's spot on. Uh, <clears throat> To that point, one of the barriers that oftentimes uh, we don't we we don't as a community address is the importance of having a mutually beneficial relationship with lending institutions. Clearly, mm -hmm. that um, yes, we're making deposits in banks, but banks need to make a deposit back into our community. Absolutely, uh, there's you know the the, the community reinvestment act. Um, 1964 uh, speaks specifically to banks making investments, giving back to their communities, um, and we're going to address that too on this on this platform. We have uh, two banks um, that are heavily involved with um, with uh, minority businesses in another life that I lead, and so we're going to have uh, Mid Penn Bank President Roy Retrieve on, you know, in, the, in an upcoming week as well as we're going to uh, talk with Orstown Bank as well. But um, as of right now, what we're trying to ensure is that our minority businesses as a whole and the entrepreneurs and start, you know, you name it, our black businesses truly understand that where you put your money is your power. And mm -hmm. they, you, much like elected officials, yeah. they, you, you don't work for them. And I, I'll never forget um, and I won't mention any names right now uh, because this individual is not here to defend him or herself. Um, but I'll just say um, I'll never forget having a, an engagement, we'll say, with one of our elected officials. And I was not in support of that person at all. And that person knew it. And I let everybody else know it. Uh, and that person ended up winning the election. And I approached the individual and I said, well, you know, you have access to these resources, particularly in the areas of X, Y, Z. And I think it sh they should be uh, implemented over here. Here's an idea. Here's and it wasn't, is that a good idea? It wasn't, I don't have the resources. It was personal. And the yeah. person asked me, why would I um, support, support that which you're bringing to me when I heard that you said X, Y, Z about me? I said, well, first of all, I did say that about you. And I said it to you. I said, another side is you do it because I'm a constituent. You're an elected official. You work for me. I don't work for you. And mm -hmm. we started to get that mindset. Once we started to clearly understand whether that's in banking, whether that's dealing with, um, with regard, with respect, of course, um, that I didn't always show, I'll say, um, even if that's in the field of education, you know, where you're approaching, you know, um, a parent teacher conference or, you know, whatever it is, you need uh, to make sure that, you know, it is a mutually beneficial relationship. The teachers, the educators, the principals, the superintendents, they are not there. The school board members are not there. If you're not entrusted in that particular, uh, school district with your children, your pride and joy, um, mm -hmm. that bank is not there. If you are not investing, if you are not putting in, you know, putting resources into those accounts. And so we need to ensure that, um, we clearly understand that every aspect of life, um, as black people in particular, that everything has to be mutually beneficial. I'm not saying quid pro quo illegal. I am talking about things being mutually beneficial, though, and being unapologetically black and having the black agenda, having the black platform and being OK. Well, check that better than OK with that stand mm -hmm. standing on that. And that's what, you know, I'm thankful for, you know. Chad and Conrad for inviting me into Music Man Multimedia Studios and being able to have um, this platform, this podcast um, to, to do that, because that's something that Harrisburg in the region has been missing. Well, check that has never had, has yearned for.
you want to talk about the Wiz, if you want to talk about um, uh, um, uh, 1400 to touch, with all due respect, it is not this. It is not what this has the potential to become. What this is becoming organically, even as we speak here tonight. And um, it is something that our communities of color overall, yes, has been yearning for, but more importantly, black people deserve. Black people earned. Black people will continue to maintain because it is something that is going to feed the soul, literally and figuratively. And so um, I just, I can't thank you enough. Um, and I'm not cutting you off. I'm just looking in the uh, comment section, looking for um, some feedback from the audience that's watching and or um, the phone lines that are that are uh, coming in. Phone lines are still open. Before, but take off from there. Um, yeah, I, I would say like I, I wholeheartedly agree. Like I'm always engaging with my peers of like, you know, like how do we, um, how do we move the ball? You see what I'm saying? So I feel like each generation catches it in a certain spot. Sometimes it's a lateral pass where you don't really move too much. Sometimes we won't go five, 10 yards. So like now that I'm here inside this position, it's like, how do I continue to make sure I'm not making a backward pass? I'm not making a, a lateral pass. I'm truly making a, a forward pass hopefully getting closer to that touchdown. So I think my part is, is always the staying in tune of continue to knock down barriers, but not only just do that personally for myself, but being able to um, guide others and be able to use my knowledge to educate others or create, you know, pathways. And one thing I definitely, you know, and this is just me just talking to you now too, is just like, I'm really big on trying to figure out or even partner with, you know, people inside of Harrisburg, I figured out like a, a comprehensive way to provide mentorship throughout the city. So like, you know, if someone, you know, if you if you look at like kids within the district, there's about, this a range from like 6,000 to 8,000 kids, right? Um, you know, what would it look like at time as every, you know, when someone hits third grade that they have access to a, to a mentor? where it doesn't necessarily have to, and I think what, what I love about where we are right now, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who is physically there because there's so much virtual technology now. So there's so many different people with inside the city of Harrisburg, with inside, um, you know, outside the city who just want to pour back where having someone just to um, give you positive vibes or give you advice or being inside a certain situation. And I think a lot of times when we look at mentorship um we always look at it as like this polished person who has all these degrees and are making all this money and really it's that's not that's not the only way to mentor like it's really it goes back to truly having someone who just cares for you going back to that that euphoria euphoria you feel of feeling cared for that some kids are, are yearning for so I think if we can put together a comprehensive way, I know there's a lot of nonprofits that do a lot of mentorship, but realizing like, hey, you know, you have this school of Ameros, like how do we partner with like, you know, what Floyd Stokes is doing as far as 100 Men Read and things of that nature, or what's Breaking the Chain is doing and really devise a plan and saying like, all right, for this school year, we're going to need about 100 mentors, you know, who's taking the call. So I can take two or three. You see what I'm saying? And what does those check-ins and things of that, that nature look like? Because I think if that's a, available, and I, and also this is just me just, just throwing things on the wall. And it's not just from a mentorship from just like, you know, that's one aspect of being inside like school. But I feel like as young adults or, you know, or even people or adults are looking to get into different, you know, business avenues or different things of that nature, of figuring like, hey, who is my pipeline of mentorship? Because what I hear a lot is like, hey, I want to do this, but I don't know who to talk to or I don't know where to begin. You know, a lot of times what the pushback is sometimes is saying like, oh, well, you're not seeking out the right pe person. Like, well, how can we didn't talk to this and that? And it was just like, well, I didn't know or I, I didn't feel like I was ready. So it's kind of knocking down those, those walls because I know there's a lot of people who are who have experienced things who know a lot, such as you, Leland, a um, whole bunch of people across the city who, if you ask them for help, they're going to they're gonna give you that help and guide you along that right path or give that information you need. It is about really making it in a way where, you know, it's comprehensive, strategic, where you don't feel like you have to knock down a wall or you have to really come out yourself too much because it's already set up. 
Okay. Uh, we're going to go to the line. You have uh, Tamika from, and her question is dealing with mentorship strictly for uh, Mr. Cornel uh, well, to you, uh, Cornelius, pretty much. So, hello, caller. Um, you're live at ASAT, a seat at the table. Glad to have you on. You have the, the, the distinct privilege of being our first caller. Uh, so, go ahead with your question, please. Thank you, Mr. Singleton. This question is for Cornelius Johnson. As a young black man who grew up in the city of Harrisburg, and as you mentioned, faced uh, circumstances that a lot of young black kids do, having two different parents in two different homes, going through school systems that weren't always equitably funded, all of those types of things. What was the difference for you that kept you on track? And what separates a young man like you from so many of the young people that we're now seeing in Harrisburg getting caught up in uh, these violent shootings in the gangs. What can we as adult mentors do to help keep our young people on track so that they, A, like you, even get the opportunity to attend college or trade school or <coughs> go directly into the workforce, whatever they want to do, and then B, to help them to succeed once they get there? Yeah. So great, great question. Um, so at first I'll talk a little bit about me and like some of those things that I think made a difference. And then I'll kind of translate it to maybe some ideas for kids um, nowadays. So for me, um, you know, my mom was, my mom had me when she was young. Um, my mom swears she's still young. So, you know, if you ask her, that's what she's going to say. But, um, you know, for me, my mom kept me engaged. So like I was involved, like I played football for East Shore Royals. I wasn't that great. I didn't make it to the NFL. I was a fat, stubby kid. I played the line, you see what I'm saying? But it kept me engaged. Um, my mom also made sure that um, she wasn't like, um, like, so like my mom would make sure like my, my work was done. So it was things of that nature where at home, I feel like she had a strong foundation. I'm not you know, she wasn't tutoring me or anything, but she had a breast of certain things where, you know, there was a sense of feeling cared for. Same thing on same thing when I went over to my dad's house. I went over to my dad's house, you know, between like my dad and my stepmom, they made sure I was engaged. I got involved in um I was actually, you know, used to swim competitively uh when I was 15, 16 years old. I was earlier than that, probably 13 I started. And because my stepmom, she used to swim for um, the Mid Harrisburg Middle School back when they used to have a swim team and then they have a pool anymore. So she taught me how to swim. And um, I got into that. I was like one of the only black kids who did that. But I say that to say, like, feeling cared for and then also being involved in programs. So, like, I was in Teen Achievers. Um, so I was able to meet kids through there, went on college tour. So um, a lot of those programs still exist. I think what we have to realize is, what you know, um, Carl may have, have done when he was a kid, what you may have done when you were a kid, Miss Tamika, what I may have done as a kid. So it probably looks what I've done when I was a kid looks different than what maybe Carl's upbringing and what our current kids and the things their interests looks different. So we have to analyze like currently the things that they're into. So we know that kids, we still have kids who are who, who like sports. We have kids who are also into video games. We have kids who are also into um, different just computer programming and different things of that nature. Girls are into different things. I think we just have to understand what they're into and create the environments um, where they can be engaged and involved in that. Because I, what I hear a lot of time is saying like, well, when I was a kid, we did this. You know, and we have to realize that kids involved in what they're into is a lot different. And it's our job to create those avenues where they can still be involved to express themselves. And I think what people sometimes say is saying like, hey, you know, with, with my story, someone can say, well, it started at home. And I, I give a, a lot of credit to my mom and what she she did as far as what she was able to do and my, my dad and all the other people in my life who were able to do at home. But we also have to realize that everyone doesn't necessarily have that strong foundation, but it's up to the community to step in to to help raise that child and stop putting it back on onto that household that we know cannot provide for that basic need. So the so, more that we realize so, and analyze that, the more the more we can kind of press forward. So I think one of the one of the keys um, that that you that you touched on, which is definitely which definitely needs to be um, 
um, highlighted is uh, as parents, overall parents in the community, um, whether that's biological and or, you know, vicarious parents, um, we have to understand that we cannot uh, prepare our kids for success based on what success looked like and meant for us uh, because this world has changed drastically. Um, I had this conversation, you know, with, with my, my children personally, you know, the things that I did at 15, 16, you know, that was just malicious boy things or, or, or you know, if you were a female, female things um, that we boys being boys, if it was, oh, you, a group of y'all talked about another kid. That's now bullying. That's now zero tolerance. That's now a whole different, you know, a set of consequences that are present today that were not even thought of back then. You know, and I'm saying when I was coming through, when you were coming through, when others in this room were coming through. So that is that is a, a great point um, to your point of talking about. In essence, there's really nothing new under the sun. Uh, we know we need mentor protege or mentoring opportunities for our kids, our young people. Um it would be blasphemous if I did not highlight uh, the Marcus of RV program that was uptown, uptown Camp Curtin YMCA with Mr. Mike Cooper and Mr. Joe Smooth uh, Sr. and, you know, Karen Wright, um, Charlotte Plains, Ms. Peg, you know, so those uh, Sherman Cunningham, Des Mangus, you know, Cam, there, there, there's a legacy of service that we all have been, um, that we all have benefited from. And so to whom much is given, much is required. We, those names, I'm not the only one who those names poured into. Um, but going forward, we highlight, when we talk about uh, faith and courage in that order, uh, when you look at uh, Anthony Duke Burnett, um, mm -hmm. who is, you know, with Loop B and G, you know, um, he is an individual that to your earlier point, when you start talking about growing mentor, uh, protege, uh, mentor, mentee opportunities outside of the school walls. So it's not that some, a lot of times, especially in this new age tech, technology, our young people, they need, just like they're virtually learning now, they need that virtual connection one-on-one. -on -one. I know personally uh, with um, now with uh, a new board over at the Allen Hill Community Center where Duke has been able to come in and um, start programming you know, once again, now that COVID is, uh, at least our the COVID restrictions aren't as um, strenuous as they were December 12th through uh, January, yeah, December 12th through January 4th. And so Loop BNG is is, a, is the organization that is, I'm sure, going to be doing great things in a pocket where there was once um, a safe house, if you will, in, in that of the Allison Hill Community Center. He is helping rebrand, rebirth that, if you will. Um, so... Now, having uh, having said that, with regards to the need for mentor, you know, it's almost easier um, doing it this way. Mm -hmm. Could you? We can only uh, book you when you were available um, to travel here personally, physically. We would probably yeah. be months out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're we're able to do this now, and we're able to mentor kids. We're able to talk and highlight the fact that you know we have TLC work based training. And, you know, that um, in essence could re is, you know, replacing the the void of the William Penn trades because everybody's not going to college. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is the truth. And even having degrees, I still pick up the phone, you know, when I need a plumber. I still pick up the phone when I need a trades man or a woman. And I, I by the time I pick up the phone and hang up, that that's 30 to $60 just for the phone call without even showing up. We're not even talking about parts and et cetera. So there are, there are opportunities out here for our young people to be exposed to that, in essence, are great career pathways, not just merely back-breaking jobs. And so we need to highlight that. Um, there's opportunities that um, are in place right now. The Harrisburg Promise Program, which is, you know, in essence, uh, SETCO um, mm -hmm. that we for. So yeah, we're we're in, we're in positions now to really highlight um, opportunities that are readily available in our communities, um, especially you know in this day and age. Um, and I think we need to make sure with platforms like these, not only to seat at the table, but other shows that are going to be coming, you know, to you from um, Music Man Multimedia Center that highlights um, 
opportunities out there now that everyone all of a sudden understands that equity and diversity and everything is cool, if you will, um, on the backs of current day martyrs, such as but not limited to Atiana Jefferson, Mr. George Floyd, um, Ms. Sandra Bland, and, and the baby, uh, Tamir Rice, you know, just say, you know, just a few names. And so now America is is at least giving out policy or, or, or making making statements that are um, embedding diversity and inclusion and understanding of the need and the um, em empirical data that speaks directly to social equity. Um, I think it's not robbery that we lead that charge in helping them understand where we can really place those resources and how they can be most useful and helpful and how to sustain those uh, levels of commitment that the PNCs of the world or, or, or the Wells Fargo's or, or, or these institutions, uh, UPMC or, you know, Penn State Hershey Health, you know, that they're making in, um, uh, uh, or, or as well as um, Public Utility Commission, um, uh, that, that these statements that they're making with regards to addressing their policy for uh, more inclusionary uh, actions um, recognize while recognizing that there has been a systemic um, omission of black people in particular. So, um, again, uh, the phone lines are open, 717-903-8760. Cornelius, is there something that, that has struck you or something? Um, um, I, I know one thing that we have not touched on, which um, uh, is, is another uh, definite need for us to address is, is this pandemic. You yeah. Know? Um, so overall, we, we've talked about the D.C. riots and, and domestic terrorism, but there's also that has o almost overshadowed the fact that we are still trying to thrive throughout a pandemic. And what that means, not only for uh, the community at large, but in particularly disproportionality with regards to social determinants of health um, within the black community in COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm I'm heavily as far as my role with um, Chick Fil A now, um, as far as like following and understanding the pandemic on how I serve like our restaurants, um, you know that encompasses a lot of my work as far as understanding the um, facts about the virus, understanding even just the facts about the vaccine, and being in a position. Hold on, let's start. I got a computer's going down. Um, being in a position to, let's see, I'm gonna get right now. Hold on. All right, I'm good. Good now. Um, must be yeah. that must that must be a Samsung device. <laughs> yeah, we got an internal running joke in here. You know, this <laughs> guy, guy he got the Samsung that runs everything. He think he's got the greatest phone and everything. Oh, man. There's, well, there's, yeah. So, so just understanding this, like, hey. Um, this virus, first thing is this virus is real. Um, it's important that we are following, you know, social distancing, keeping our, our, ourselves safe, wearing a mask, um, acknowledging the truth about these, these realities. Um, it, it is painful to kind of see um, what affects, you know, when you are um, disproportionately um, affected by a, a virus, you know, which Black people have always been disproportionately treated inside America. So it, it reveals itself inside certain pandemics. So, you know, we're more and more you're hearing more loved ones um, coming down with COVID, being in the hospital for COVID, and unfortunately passing away from COVID. And even as you were thinking about, you know, what is the next step of moving forward as far as trusting science um, for a vaccine? You know, and people have different viewpoints on the vaccine. I'm not going to tell people like exactly like how they should look at it and things of that nature, but we do have to acknowledge that a, a lot of that our mistrust come from a, a rooted place. Um, and so it puts us in a tough position where, hey, like we're listening, you know, to the science, we listen to the facts, and we we understand the importance of, of why this may be a value, value to us. But at the same time, it's just like, hey, in the back of our mind, we remember, you know, a lot of these these same things being told to us before. So what makes this time different? For me, at least, and I'm just talking for me, 
is um, the more access and opportunity. So the the beautiful part about like uh, you know social media, um, Clubhouse, and and some of the some of the strides we have been able to to make is there is more people that look like us who are inside these rooms looking for the best interests of us. So it may not be, you see what I'm saying? Like it's still being dominated by the majority culture, but there, there are more black doctors. There are more black people sitting on these boards as you're going through approval process of these vaccines and things of that nature. So, you know, it kind of gives you a little bit more confidence, but I think everyone should kind of weigh it out um, in essence of analyzing their own health, their own risks and how they move in life um, to kind of make that decision personally for themselves, um, but, but truthfully looking at the facts. And also also realizing that, um, you know, until you make that decision, you have to move inside a certain way to kind of protect your peace, protect your family and making smart decisions um, in regards to being safe while we're going through this pandemic. That's real heavy. Um, one of the things um, I'll, I'll just add in, in conclusion on that is, as we talked about raising students, raising children, raising our nieces, nephews, whomever, current times as opposed to the previous times, um, I, the thing that gives me some some hope, if you will, uh, with regards to uh, taking possibly, you know, taking the vaccine when it becomes available is the fact that it's been given to the first responders first. You understand? Mm -hmm. With regard to if they're taking people out like they did with the Tuskegee experiment, the powers that be, are they going to take out, and this is rhetorical, are they going to take yeah. out all of the medical uh, individuals that are you know, set up to help take care of us? And that's just rhetorical. I'm not telling you, yeah. not, but I'm not asking this audience to do it or not to do it. I'm doing it, but I'm not saying you know, what, what you should do. So, you know, I just like to, you know, at this point, Cornelius, I cannot thank you enough for your time, your energy, um, the excitement that exudes you just from, you know, our, our pre-meeting, uh, if you will, and the jewels that you've dropped on this show um, will, will live in a positive infamy uh, uh, with regards to um, where we can, what we can do from this platform to ensure that young people, male and female, black, white, and everyone in between have a positive role model to look to. And that, that role model is you. That young person is you. That individual who continues to give back and strive for excellence in the community is you. And that's why we wanted you on here. Um, so with that, I just, again. Well, I, yeah, I, let, me, let me personally, and I, this wasn't scripted or anything, let me personally thank you because um, from the very, 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 very beginning of, you know, of me kind of meeting you personally, like I, you know, went to school with your, your daughter, I'm a little bit older than her, but um, just like when you heard it, I was starting to get involved. You all, you were like person raised to, to clear the pathway. You didn't want there to be any gatekeepers. You always, you know, respected me as a, as a young person and you always empowered me. And I think that it, that is so powerful. And I think um, you have done that for a lot of young black um, male and female people coming through the city. And um, I think, you know, you, sh you know, you got to give people the roses um, for that. And, and I, I appreciate you. You always even, you know, my decision of moving down here, giving me good counsel, even just staying connected right now, like. And the things that you're able to do just in your work uh, with the um, Pennsylvania Diversity Co Coalition, realizing that economic equity, you see what I'm saying, is 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 very important. Like we can we can and fight for policies and things of that nature, but we also have to be able to fulfill basic needs that have been missing from our community for a very, very long time. So your work inside that area, partnering with other people doing that as well, is, is, is amazing. And I think um, I'm very, very grateful for you. I'm very, um, you know, I, I'm just I'm just thankful for you, man. You've always, always been there for me. You know, because of 45, you're supposed to have your check for that, that, that presentation. <laughs> in the mail now i'm sure it's closer to atlanta but no i uh, thank you thank you for being you again thank 
you know, for your mom, your dad, your extended family for um, allowing us to share in your successes and um, allow you to serve us and for us to serve you. So we wish you well. Um, this is not your, uh, it is, it is your first time on the show, but it definitely will not be your yeah, life. Happy to be back, man. Happy to be back. But thank you very much. We're going to sign off with you. Um, and we'll touch base um, at a short time later. Thanks again. All right. All right. Yeah. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we cannot thank you enough for uh, tuning in for the last uh, hour and, and, and 30 minutes. Um, just to, 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 for you to be here for this being our first, uh, launch, we appreciate you. Um, again, I'd like to thank the Lewis brothers, Conrad and Craig Chad from the district, the overall Harrisburg community, um, the capital region, of course, Mr. Cornelius, uh, Johnson, who is down in Atlanta now, but he is still Harrisburg's own. Um, there's, there's greatness to come. Those young people that are still in this community that have uh, the thrive um, to be excellent. We're here to support you. We're here, we value you. We will never marginalize or underestimate you. Um, we love you.